Hey, how are you? This is Ryan, Ryan Saplin, fat loss strength coach. I'm going to talk to you about some weightlifting, strength training. Haven't talked about this for a little while. I've been doing a lot of fat loss videos and core exercise videos lately. And for those that follow the channel closely or are on my email list, get updates. But I wanted to talk to you about what I talked to about a client of mine today. And it sort of got me fired up. And it was about powerlifting. It was about lifting weights. And I told her, you know, what get, what I enjoy the most about weight training, I made this, I, I mean, what I enjoy the most about powerlifting, lifting heavy is the fear. It's the, the fear of the weight crushing you, right? And, and as I talk about it, it, it just, it kind of, it just, I get this buildup of energy. It's cool. It's like, what did I told her this, how I explained it to her. There's here, this is what you can do. And this is what you think you can do. And then on any given day, you will feel a little bit more confident and push yourself to get yourself as close to what you can actually do. Like for a squat, for example, right? Or when you're not feeling too great, feeling like a, a wuss or whatever you want to call some negative term, you will, this is what you can do. And then this is what you actually do or what you think you can do anyway. And then I said, this is what you can do. And this is what you think you can do. This is dangerous. That's how you get hurt. It's actually how you get injured. And I bring this up because it's, it's, I was just thinking, because I'm just imagining myself, like if you saw my tornado video, I talked about my, one of my classic styles of videos that I used to make on my channel, uh, which I'll make more of soon, is the, the risk of getting hurt. And I won't even really call it the risk of getting hurt. I guess there is a little, there's a little bit of a rush when it comes to the risk of actually getting hurt. I find that the hardest thing is, is really just that, that feeling of overcoming circumstance, overcoming the weight. Because essentially, essentially what happens is you get under the bar and you unrack and then you just descend into the hole. And, and almost to a point of, of like, I don't know what the word is, but it's like you're, you're losing yourself in preparing to lift. And you put the blinders on and you cannot see anything. You cannot hear anything. At least you try not to, right? You blast the music up in your headphones. And all you can think about is setting up and squatting fast, staying tight, bracing your abs, going through your setup sequence, doing it fast. It's a, it's a, it's a process that's automatic almost. Like you can't really... You can't do like, oh, tighten my stomach, pull my shoulders back. It's almost all the time what happens is you just get under the bar and everything happens automatically. Everything you've done up until that point for that working set or maybe that heavy single or double or triple or maybe just a PR rep max or even a PR for one rep max, you hope that all the setup you did, all the warm-ups you did up until that point has you prepared to automatically set up. And if you have a moment to think, it just goes to show that you have more in the tank. And that's the part I love. It's you you have you lose yourself to a point of focus. It's, it's if you ever ran before, if you did cardio a lot, or I ran some marathons, it's sort of like you get through this process. You know, I've run a full marathon before in 2010, and you're going and you get into the zone, and before you know it, an hour has passed by, you know, and you're, you know, five or six miles along the way. You know, I ran 26 miles. Oh my God, I can't believe that. But it's hard. It's, it's treacherous. And it, but then you're hoping to find those moments where you're just going and you get lost. And in powerlifting, I, it's almost like that sort of that runner's high, but it's condensed in such an intense moment. It's so intense. And God, I miss it. So my question to you is, what do you do? What gets you excited about training? You know, at this current moment, of course, there's lots of different things that gets us excited about training. Uh, right now, what gets me excited about training is making content. I mean, I have no reason to really work out the way I want to. I mean, I'm getting leaner. I'm going to get some abs, six pack and show some progress of videos or clips again, pictures again. But the reality is that's not really motivating me to train other than I got to maintain some fitness level, chin ups, push ups. You know, as far as heavy deadlifts are concerned, I just don't have the time to the vote, the necessary preparation for it. Like I can go and deadlift, but I got to do mobility, got a foam roll. I got to like take care of myself. Uh, otherwise I'm going to pay for it because if I can't sit down and write, if I can't sit down 
if I can't make videos, if I can't work, if I'm distracted by pain, um, I'm going to have some problems. Now, of course, that sounds like an excuse, and it is an excuse. It's an excuse that I'm in a different phase of my life. And pretty soon here, I'm going to come back to the heavy lifting. I, you know, I just talking about it makes me want to lift the weights. But this is just, again, one of those personal videos that I wanted to make for you. Um, you, the viewer that watches these videos, because again, I only have a segment of my channel that watches this kind of stuff. Uh, I did have um, someone asked to make a video about the lateral hip shift. Uh, you know, I'm going to go through some of my questions right now while I'm at it, you know. Um, someone asked to do a video on lateral hip shift, and I really haven't had the time to make it. I want to make it, but I'll tell you right now, a lot of the lateral hip shift has to do with a weak gluteus medius. So what happens is if you're left, if you're if you shift your body weight to the to the left, for example, that means your gluteus medius is weak on the left side, and your body is shifting the left side. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but you have to remember that what happens also is that you're when you you shift to the left side, that also usually means one of your ad both adductors are tight, your adductor magnus, right? But there's also some other things that happen. Um, so you sh if I squat and you shift to the left, left glute medius is weak, uh, right piriformis is tight, and left adductor is tight. They're both tight, though. So anyways, that, that's the compensation. So you strengthen the glute medius. But the problem that you run into, like I have in my particular kind of lateral hip shift, is um, having a tight right hip. So... So I'm shifting to the left, I have weak gluteus medius, my inner adductors are tight, specifically more on the left, I think. Yeah, more on the left, it's tighter because I'm shifting to the left. My right piriformis is tight, and my knee is kind of turning out or wanting to turn out on the right side. So what's, but then if I want to push myself to the right and try to get myself centered, uh, what's going to happen is my, I have a tight impingement in the right hip. Uh, and just a lot of stiffness, tight hip flexor. I don't have a lot of, I have a lot less internal rotation in the right hip. And generally, I'm missing internal internal rotation in the femurs of both sides. So what this is causing is causing sort of a block. So even though I want to try to keep myself right, I don't have the, the range of motion necessary to sort of complete the motion. So that's sort of one of the reasons why I shift to the left in the first place. And to kind of go into my own powerlifting or my own strength training or my own weaknesses, when I deadlifted, I used to deadlift heavy, especially for reps. Everything I felt on the left side, left glute, left everything, hamstring, it did all the work because that, that was where I was strongest. It was well, that's my, my lead drive leg on a deadlift, you know. Uh, another question I got was, so someone asked on one of my, my fat loss tips videos, fat loss tip number five, he asked, how is my cut going? I, my cut's going pretty good. I'm getting leaner and you can probably see it in my face, you know. Um, usually a seven, this is a 70 millimeter shot on the video. I don't know if that makes any sense to you, but typically 70 millimeters will make my look, face look fat. Uh, wider angles will make my face look skinny. And, um, this is 70 millimeters in and I'm pretty chiseled out. You can see my cheekbones pretty good, especially with the lights flashing on them. Um, I've got last week I did like ultra low carb for a little bit and then I went ahead and, um, what else did I do? Uh, this week I'm just doing no junk food. You know, I'll do aggressive cuts, 24 hour fast, 16 hour fast, 18 hour fast. I have a fasting program. All right, got another question here. It was about breathing exercises. Someone would like to know how to transition from breathing into bracing and how to maintain it in between reps. And uh, when you're going for heavy repetitions, when it comes to squats, you pretty much use your brace the entire time. It's just that when you're you're on the top of the squat, you you rebrace again to stay tight, uh, especially if you're working with 85% or more of your one rep max. But if you're beginning, a lot of the time you're, you're staying tight the whole time while being able to make some shallow breaths. That's actually a big part of it. Staying tight in the midsection is really a combination of being able to breathe in sort of a hollow position. Excuse me. So that hollow position to stay tight and stay braced is is essentially two things. One, using your transverse abdominals to lock your rib cage down, right? But then also allow your, your diaphragm is still able to function. You know, if you're if you're deciding to just do reps like with light weight, moderate weight, versus like doing a powerlifting rep where you do a deep breath into your abdomen, into the belt, or just create big pressure, they're different. But the general rule is, uh, how do you transition? You, you 
you don't transition. I mean, you only transition to the top. So at the top of the at the movement, you take a deep breath in and then you you exhale. Or you take you don't ever exhale. You take a deep breath in. How's that word go? Sorry, I'm like losing my train of thought. So you take a deep breath in. Uh, so squat, take a deep breath, squat, come back up, exhale, and then you let out a little bit of air at the top of the squat. Then you take a deep breath in. Fill up your abdomen, squat. Yeah, so you basically reset at the top every single time. I'll make a video on it eventually, I promise you. That was a question from Namish Grung. I have this one video, it's called I Pulled My So Ass Today, uh, Low Back Pain, and um, Keith Rosk asked, I heard mine at the gym today, this was two weeks ago. Do you recommend I massage it or rest, hot water, take an aspirin? I was doing 455 a deadlift close to one rep max, but the muscles were describing a feeling between a cramp and pulled muscle. I can't lift anything, not even a 40 pound dumbbell. Man, I hope you're better, man. Um, I'm going to have to say that you massaging it, I mean, it might help, but I'm not going to really recommend it. It sounds like you're hurt pretty good. So my general rule when it comes to any kind of traumatic pain from lifting, uh, like to that point, you say you always have to move around because you'll just get stiff. You know, and that's my thing is that you always want to move so that way you don't lose your flexibility because that's what's going to end up happening. Um, but for the most part, you can roll on it. I would just put pressure on it. I mean, you don't have to put like like a foam rolling pressure or massage it. I would just I would just put pressure on it. Like compression would be good. Like I remember when I used to have knee pain sometimes. Wearing compression, pressure, compression gear helps, you know. Uh, but for the most part, move around. Try to stay away from it makes it hurt. The psoas is weird though because it's deep inside, so it's almost always on if you're standing. So you got to get the inflammation to go down, or at least the pain to go away. When is the best time to eat carbs? Some of the one of the questions asked was actually oh that's what this that was the name of the video. He asked uh, how about if your goal is to put on muscle, would you recommend eating carbs throughout the day or still preferably a workout? Look, nutrition is pretty simple. Uh, if you kind of need more of a systemized approach, you know, I have a program that I sell, but if you're just talking about general nutrition advice and you know, a fairly good amount, it makes no difference. Really. It doesn't. I mean, some people say if you eat carbs after the workout, you're going to like restore more glycogen stores. Overall, it's not going to make that much of a difference unless maybe again, you're a physique competitor, elite athlete, some high level point where the nutrition really does matter the most. And if you think that by eating like a physique athlete or, or a professional athlete, a football, basketball player, it's not going to make that much of a difference. I, I mean, and this is my opinion. I mean, some people will argue what I say, but again, I'm talking about like the top five, one percent of people that do stuff, crazy stuff. The most important thing when it comes to putting on muscle is weight training, because even if you're in a deficit, you'll still put on muscle or you'll put on strength. Then you eat enough protein, at least one gram or about 0.8 grams per pound of body weight, and then you get enough calories. That's pretty much most of it. That's about at least 70 to 80, if not 90% of the entire equation. Weight training, getting enough protein, and getting enough calories. That's it. That's all there is to it. And if you have trouble, I hate to say this to you, but you got to eat more and you got to work out harder. Sometimes you got to work out less, but under most cases, if you work out more, you'll just eat, you eat more to compensate. That's brief and you want more. Ask a question below and I'll continue answering the question. All right, so this question is about knee pain. Hey, good video. I don't know if you will respond, but tight calves will cause valgus knee collapse. I have collapsed so bad and quad stretch doesn't seem to help. So the question is, will tight calves cause valgus knee collapse? Um, let's think about this first. Oh, I actually answered him right here. It says, yes, it will. Tight calf, tight calves will lead to your arch collapsing which will lead to valgus. So, so basically when you have tight calves, you don't have enough ankle dorsiflexion. What will happen is that your knee, uh, you, eventually your knees will try to travel forward, but because you're, you don't have the ankle flexibility, to get some extra ankle flexibility, your arches will collapse, causing your knees to collapse because arch follow, the knees follow the feet. You know, and the feet are actually really, really important. But that's all I got for this video. If you want to ask a question, Leave a question below. I'll make a video just for you because people who comment on my videos, I actually care about. I really do um, because it means you like my channel. You have questions. And if I get enough, actually, I will. I'll make a Q&A video. I just did it. Like, I literally just made a video. This You're watching this video. And um, I'll do more of these. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys later.